Great. Good morning and welcome to the second uh, session of the Children's Mental Health Learning Series. I'd like to welcome everybody here in the local audience in, uh, in a chill, on a chilly Monday morning in Edmonton. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the folks uh, participating remotely. Uh, I understand there's at least 100 plus sites connected uh, with us today. My name is Maureen Conrad. I'm the manager of uh, projects, uh, partnerships, and knowledge mobilization with the Child, Family, and Services Division. And it's our pleasure to uh, be involved and help to uh, co-sponsor the learning series. Our presenter today uh, is Rick Miller. And Rick's topic is From Kids at Risk to Kids at Hope. And we'll hear a little bit more about uh, Rick momentarily. Uh, so there are a number of housekeeping rules that apply both to the local audience and the remote sites. Um, Rick will be speaking for approximately one hour and that will be followed by a short uh, question and answer uh, session. So for the local uh, audience, we will use the microphone in the room. For the remote audiences, they are um, logging in and asking their questions remotely and Amy will facilitate uh, that process. Uh, you're very welcome to share the information with uh, colleagues. Uh, there is going to be a recorded uh, version of the session that will be available later and uh, along with the PowerPoint uh, presentation. There will be a follow-up evaluation after today's session. So for those of you uh, who attended and really it's important to get your feedback about these sessions because there will be a number of, of sessions provided over um, uh, subsequent months. We'd like your feedback so make sure you respond to that. Uh, we talked about the moderation of the session, so that will um, be after Rick concludes his uh, his piece. And one of the um, things that I failed to ask Rick is if he'd be able to provide his contact information if there is any specific questions. So you're certainly welcome to contact uh, Amy through the um, through the registration process, and perhaps Rick can provide his contact information. For those of you joining online, uh, hopefully you've tested your system in advance. <laughs> Perhaps if you haven't, that's maybe you're not connected yet. <laughs> um, if you have any technical difficulties, you'll need to contact your local uh, technical support. Okay, so that is enough about that. Our session today, as mentioned, is, is a part of a broader children's mental health learning series and initiative uh, with the government of Alberta in response to requests staff have made for more uh, detailed information about how to work with and support children and families in their communities. Uh, the session uh, in attendance and is target to uh, human services staff, frontline staff, foster parents, service providers, caregivers, and parents. Uh, we know that uh, children's mental health, adolescent mental health affects us all. So this is a series that has been made accessible to a very broad audience, including other professionals and educators, uh, who could benefit uh, from dialogue with each other, this knowledge, and sharing their um, uh, sharing in the learnings from the experts who are presenting via this webcast. So as we mentioned earlier, there will be a, a taped uh, version of this on uh, available for you. Uh, we're going to, uh, this is one of those things, you know, I stand up here and I introduce somebody who introduces the presenter, but uh, bear with us. We've asked um, Bruce Armson to join us this morning and he is the uh, co-executive director uh, of, of the Bosco Homes, and he's also the Vice President of the Alberta Association of Services for Children and Families. And they're definitely a, a valued partner uh, in the work that we do with children and families in the province. Uh, Bruce has uh, lots of experience, 25 plus years of working with at-risk children in frontline child and youth care uh, as a supervisor and manager. As, as now as Director of, of Group Care Services at Bosco, he's responsible for uh, community-based care, group care, treatment of group care, and intensive group care. So obviously children's mental health and youth mental health is uh, near and dear to, uh, to his heart. So he's going to uh, come and, and do some uh, wel a very quick welcome and then introduce our guest speaker, Rick. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I would also like to welcome all of you to the session this morning. As we all know, human services staff, families, foster parents, caregivers, and service providers face many challenges when working with children with mental health concerns. These sessions will provide helpful information that will enable effective responses and support for our children. Most of all, they are meant to inspire hope in those who are supporting children and youth faced with mental health challenges. Today's session is bound to do exactly that. Our presenter, Rick Miller, 
will explore the science of hope, optimism, and success, and how these elements can be instilled in all children without exception. Rick is the founder, president, and chief treasure hunter of Kids at Hope. He has spent 45 years educating, advocating, caring, and supporting the future of all youth. 30 of those years were spent within the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. <clears throat> Rick has been an adjunct facility faculty member with the Arizona State University since 1984. His breadth of understanding from a research perspective, academic, and practitioners establishes his credentials as one of the most informed and effective spokespersons for children. He is able to translate complicated theory into straightforward, powerful expression about what is best for youth. Please join me in welcoming Rick. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. I speak a little bit of Spanish because I'm from Arizona. And uh, I know you speak a little bit of French here because you're from Canada. Uh, but I think it's important that you know, we make each other feel comfortable as we go through this presentation. So I'm going to teach you one phrase in Spanish. Should you ever visit me in Arizona, you'll feel comfortable with our bilingual approach to uh, communication. So I'm going to teach you how to say that's exactly it in Spanish. You ready for this? I need you to spell the word socks, not like the baseball team, but like what you wear on your feet. So spell with me, S-O-C-K-S. Now say it a little bit faster, S-O-C-K-S. A little bit louder. That means that's exactly it in Spanish, S-O-C-K-S. And so if you ask me what two plus two is, and I say four, you will say to me in Spanish, S-O-C-K-S. Muy bien. Greetings from Arizona. My question is, why am I here and you're not in Arizona with me? I came in here, came yesterday and it was pretty much whiteout conditions. And uh, I left probably, it was about 85 degrees in Arizona, which would be what, about 25 degrees, 26 degrees here in Edmonton. Uh, so we have to kind of reverse these roles sometimes. And in November, you have to have this series in uh, in Arizona, and in August, we have to have the series back here in, in Edmonton. But either way, I'm pleased to be with you. I think we have a remarkable body of research, some principles and practices that will forevermore transform your understanding about children. So today, I'm going to take you on a journey from youth at risk to kids at hope. Because for too long, we've understood why children become at risk. What we don't understand is how they become at hope, and I want to explore that with you. And in order to do that, I want you to think in terms of what we can do together that we can't do alone. What we can do together, in fact, is that we can help all children become hopeful. What we can do alone is help some children become hopeful. So the idea is that me, when I become the me in me, that I can only help, I can only reach so many children. But when we become the we, then we can help all children succeed. There's an old expression that says it takes a village to raise a child. But we've never defined the village. Actually, we've never defined the villagers. Actually, we've never defined what the villagers are supposed to do to raise a child. So we kind of stop at this breadth of understanding. It takes a village, but we never dig deep into the understanding of what that looks like when it actually happens. So I want to explore that with you as well. So I'm couching this in something I call the grand experiment. And the grand experiment is something that we have a pretty interesting understanding about because we represent a similar democracy in terms of Canada and the US that we believe within our democracies that common man can govern himself. That we don't have to wait for a king or a queen or a dictator or emperor or empress to tell us what we need to do and to tell us whether we have rights or we don't have rights. That those rights are kind of given to us just by the fact that we're born. And government has no right to take that away. 
In our country, in the U.S., we couch it in terms of our Declaration of Independence, that we began this grand experiment, which you're part of, obviously, and we're part of your grand experiment, you're part of our grand experiment. We're trying to demonstrate to the rest of the world that democracy works. We haven't proven it yet. Sometimes it works better than other times. But we're not willing to give up on the experiment, are we? See, we offered that in 1776 when a freckled-faced, red-haired attorney walked into a common hall in Philadelphia and uttered these words for the first time, never stated in such a way. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, or amongst those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, those words were uttered 237 years ago. I'm just curious, if we heard those words for the first time on this date in history, 2013, November 18th, if we heard those words today, would we have listened to that person and said, are you crazy? Are you absolutely nuts? In the history of the world, we never believe that all men are created equal. We believe some men are created equal, and they're given their rights by someone else. And you're telling us that we're going to change human history by just accepting a set of words, and you're going to ask us to accept that, those set of words based on the concept it's self-evident? So what does self-evident mean? It means no proof is required. I don't have to prove anything to you. Either you believe it or you don't believe it. See, that's what democracy is. Either you sense that we have these inalienable rights that they're God-given to us, or you don't. And if you do, let's move forward and create an entire community, entire country, an entire government that supports that belief system. And if you don't, guess what we're going to do? We're going to move forward without you. Because that's how movement and change has already taken place. We don't wait for people to buy into it. So if the grand experiment which began for our countries 150, 200, 237 years ago was enough for us to commit our lives our fortunes, and our sacred honor, what would be the ex grand experiment for the year 2013? And what about this one? That all children and youth are capable of success, no exceptions. Isn't that as nutty as what we heard when it said all men are created equal? As a matter of fact, I don't even have to prove it to you. It's self-evident that all men are created equal. No proof is required. See, there's something about the human spirit that understands things that sometimes we don't have to ask a researcher to prove for us. Sometimes that human spirit says, I just know things that I don't need proof about. I know, in fact, that all men are created equal. I know, in fact, that all children are capable of success, no exceptions. So if that's the case, why are some children doing very well? some children doing okay, and why are so many children struggling today? So I think it's worth our time to kind of go back a little bit and see how we created a world where some children do well, others seem to do okay, and why so many kids today seem to struggle when in fact this is the grand experiment where they're, that we're trying to demonstrate works today as it should have always worked for kids. What can we do differently today that we've not done before? To, able, to be able to pursue this journey with you, there's three things that I need from you. I need you to see yourself as a hopeologist, a person that takes the time to study hope, that begins to understand the dynamics of hope, the science of hope. Why do some people seem to have a lot of, bit of, a lot of hope? Why do some people seem to have a little bit of hope? And why are there so many people in the world that seem to have no hope at all? Where does hope come from? Does it come in your DNA? Are you lucky enough to be born with hope, or is it a gift given to you by your parents? And if your parents aren't hopeful, how do they teach you how to be hopeful? So if you're born into a family that's not a hopeful family, then where do you learn hope? Is it taught to you by a teacher, by a caregiver, by a friend? Where does this concept of hope come from? And I, so I want you to take a moment. I want you to think about yourself as a hopeologist. And the reason that's important is because so often, we just go around life thinking that we're very busy people. See, sometimes we're so busy, we can't even think we're just busy. By show of hands, how many people out there believe they're a busy person? By show of hands. 
Yeah, most of us believe we're very busy people. Let me test how busy busy is. By show of hands, I'm going to kind of go on a spectrum of busyness, right? By show of hands, how many people are so busy they can't even remember where they're supposed to be and what time they're supposed to be there? They're so busy they actually have to keep a calendar. If you keep a calendar, raise your hand. Now, I thought I was going to be visiting with busy people. I just didn't know how busy you were. That's pretty darn busy. They have to keep a calendar. How many of you are so busy, not only you have to keep a calendar to tell you where you're supposed to be and what time you're supposed to be there, you're so busy beyond that, you actually have to keep a separate to-do list. How many people have to keep a to-do list? That's pretty darn busy. And how many people are so busy in their lives that they have to keep a calendar to-do list? They actually have people in their lives that remind them what's on their calendar and what's on their to-do list. Yeah. So we have crazy busy in our cultures. And we tend to get our stripes by how busy we are, right? That we begin to talk to people, typically, typically, gee, I don't know if I can be at that meeting. I don't know if I can get that report done in time. I don't know if I can get to that conference. I don't know if I can get to that event. I don't know if I can provide that service because we're just so busy. We're busy being busy. And if I called you at your offices, somebody would answer the phone and say something like this. I'm sorry he or she can't come to the phone right now. They're busy. See, this is what I don't hear, and this is what I think we need to change for the hour or so that we're here together. That for a moment in time, let's take this as that moment in time. For that moment in time, let's pretend that we're not busy and have somebody answer our phone with this remark. I'm sorry he or she can't come to the phone right now. They're thinking. Seriously? Seriously? When do you have time to think? You're so busy running from one meeting to the next, writing one application to the next, preparing one grant to the next, having one report to the next, having one event after the next, one service provider to talk to after the next. When do you have time to think? And it's that ability to think that makes us transformative. It's when we're busy that we maintain the status quo. So the few moments we're together, let's, let's have someone be answering our phone and saying, I'm sorry, he or she can't come to the phone right now, there. This is the other side of that equation that I want you to offer to that person who's calling you. I want you to be able to say, I'm sorry, he or she can't come to the phone. And I think this would be remarkable if we could ever say this, absolutely remarkable. I'm sorry, he or she can't come to the phone right now. They're having fun. Is our jobs about fun? Is our jobs about having play? Or is our job so serious we can't see the fun and opportunity and optimism and success that our jobs offer us because we don't get up in the morning and say we're going to fun. We say we get up in the morning and we're going to work. That we're like miners. We've got to trudge into the deep mines and we have to go to work. But we're working with children. When you're working with children, isn't that fun? Because when you sit back and you observe and you think about what you're seeing, by and large, we're seeing children having fun. And we as adults don't like that, do we? So we say to preschoolers and we say to kindergartners, it's time to stop playing. Now we got to get to work. Seriously? When you're in preschool and kindergarten, it's time to go to work? When so much of your development, so much of what you've learned about the world has been through fun, you're going to now eliminate that from the equation and you're going to tell four-year-olds, three-year-olds, five-year-olds to quit having fun, which is the way they've learned up to the first five years, this remarkable period of growth and development, and you're going to say, stop having fun, it's time to go to work? When have we become insane? See, children should know that we can have fun as adults that our smiles come easy, our laughter comes easy, our sense of happiness comes easy. Because we create that happiness around us, not dealt to us. We don't get good cards and bad cards, we get cards. And when we get those cards, we look at them and we play the cards we have. We don't even exchange them because we can create happiness from the cards we get. Because that comes up here. It doesn't come in the physical form of those cards. So I want you to think of yourself as hobologists. I also want you to think of yourself as geniuses. I'm looking around the room, and I don't think some of you believe me that that can actually happen to you. But trust me, I think you can become a genius by the time we're done today. And my idea of a genius is someone who can see a world that doesn't exist. See, that's the difference between a genius and a realist. A realist is someone who predicts the future based on the past. 
That's the only information they have. So everything that they see in the future is based on past experience, but a genius is someone who can create a future that doesn't exist. A genius is someone who actually lives in that future and invites the rest of us to join him or her in that future. That see, we were born with the same number of brain cells Albert Einstein was. We were born with 100 billion brain cells. 100 billion. Look in somebody's ear next to you and start counting them. Do you see 100 billion brain cells? Because they're there. They're there. As a matter of fact, we're born with as many brain cells as we'll need to live our entire lives. We have more brain cells than we actually need. Our brain begins to prune away those brain cells we don't use. So we know we have the genius. That was part of the miracle of becoming a human being is that we were blessed with this capacity to be a genius. It was not to be a realist because a realist is stuck in the past and the present. They're never able to create a future. And the third title I'd like you to think about is that of becoming a treasure hunter. Because for too long, we've allowed people to give us titles that really don't describe what we do. We think it does, but it doesn't. We're a caregiver, we're a mental health worker, we're a psychologist, we're an executive director, we're a school person, we're a superintendent, we specialize in disabilities. I mean, they're giving us titles that just have to do with our bureaucracy, but not with our children. What has to do with our children is that every child has treasures. And our job, our title is to be their treasure hunter is to find the treasures that exist in all children. And for some children, those treasures are deeply buried. For some children, you're gonna to have to dig long and hard for those treasures. But there's one great guarantee in life, and that is every child has a treasure. But they're looking to the adults in their lives to help them discover that treasure. They're not born with that insight. That comes from the outside in. That's why you're in their lives, not to be caregivers, not to be their psychologists, not to be their mental health workers, not to be their teachers, but to be their treasure hunters. The rest of it's about your bureaucracy. I'm not talking about your bureaucracy. I'm not talking about the title somebody gave you. I'm talking about the title that you've, you've given to yourself, that you see yourself as a, tre as a treasure hunter. But here's where I draw the line in the sand. You can become a hopeologist if you choose to, and I want you to be. You, become, you can become a, a genius, and I want you to be. And you can actually become a treasure hunter, and I want you to be. But here's where I draw the line in the sand. Under no circumstances are you allowed to leave this room with the illusion or delusion that you could become the chief treasure hunter. Because that's moi. Okay, let's see if we learned anything so far. This is the pop quiz here at Kids at Hope University, the only university that offers a certificate in hopeology, where you can become a genius, where you can also become a treasure hunter. So at our end of our hour today, that you're going to become a hope what? That you're also going to unleash your inner what? And where you're going to confer upon yourself the title of treasure what? But under no situation will you be allowed to leave with the illusion or delusion that you could become the with a little bit more enthusiasm, that you could leave with the illusion or delusion that you could become the? Because that's who? Now we can move forward. So the question is, the question is, Rick, you say that all children are capable of success, no exceptions. That's kind of the grand experiment in the year 2013 and beyond. And it, in fact, is the grand experiment. As a matter of fact, it's like our forefathers. It's an experiment we're not willing to give up on. See, sometimes we don't have the patience for an experiment to play itself out. Sometimes if it doesn't work in a year or two or three or four or five, we're willing to throw the baby out with the bathwater. See, we have to run from program to program, initiative to initiative, new service to new service, new funding priority to new funding priority, that we don't have the patience to understand that sometimes things take a little bit slower so this idea that we're engaged in this common vision that we're going to prove to the rest of the world that democracy works, we haven't proved it yet. But we haven't given up on it yet either. Now we're not willing to come up with a new government every five years because this one doesn't work. That we have constitutions and laws that govern the way we, we approach our, our lives. So when we talk about success, let's get a, a, a handle on what we mean by success. And what we did is we went around the country, both of our countries, Canada and the U.S., and we asked a thousand of you to define the word success. Anybody want to guess how many different definitions we got? We got a thousand different definitions. 
we found that the people really don't have a definition of success. That's kind of left out for the rest of us to decide what we think success is for us, but how do we then share that with our children? How when our children move from organization to organization, agency to agency, institution to institution, and somebody else is defining success in a different way for them? Doesn't that send, tend to confuse them? So in our research, we went back and we began to study what success really was, and we, we looked at it, at it under a microscope, and we actually discovered three types of success. The first type of success is called personal success. Whatever you decide is successful for you and you achieve it, guess what, you're personally successful. If you want to lose five pounds and you lost five pounds, you're a success. If you want to learn to quote the blanket and you quote the blanket, you're a success. If you want to run a 5K and you run a 5K, you're a success. It's what you decide is successful for you and you achieve it, you're a success. Nobody should ever take that away from you. And nobody should ever question the value of that success. The only conditions we place on it, we hope it's not unethical, immoral, or illegal. Beyond that, it could be anything you want it to be. Sometimes we forget to ask children what their definition of success is, what their personal definition. Sometimes we want to impose our definition of success. Sometimes we set up our conditions for success for them. And if they achieve it, in our minds, they're successful. If they don't achieve it, we leave them with the message that they're less successful. Or sometimes they get the message that they may be a failure because we've artificially created what success is for them. The second definition of success is what we call organizational definition of success. And that's the type of success that we're obsessed with. Because we get a paycheck from our organization, our organization has defined what success is for us. If it's a test score, if it's a standard, if it's a set of uh, metrics, if it's a rubric, and whatever it is, we have to achieve that level because somebody said it to us and we're willing to pay, get a paycheck from that person. We're willing to give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay and somebody else has defined what success is and we understand that if you go to school, guess what? School's gonna have a definition of success for you. You achieve it, you're successful in that organization alone. You may not be successful any place, but in that organization, you're successful. So we have to understand organizations create definitions of their success that you have to buy into. If all of us changed jobs today and went to work for McDonald's hamburgers tomorrow, guess what? Our definition of organizational success is gonna change. If all, all of us left McDonald's the next day and went to work for a regional mental health center or a, let's say a hospital, we would have a different definition of success. If we went to work for a football team, we'd have a different definition of success. So the organization defines it. Third definition is the one I'm gonna concentrate on for the few moments I have, and that's the cultural definition of success. And the cultural definition really sp speaks to the village. If it takes the village, what is the village helping our children to achieve? They're helping our children to become culturally successful. And where does that take place? And I wanna explain that to you in a few moments. So Dr. Einstein gave us a pretty good hint in terms of changing the conditions from which we live. The conditions from which we live is that some kids do very well, some kids seem to do okay, and regardless of what else happens, there are kids who struggle from disabilities and foster care, mental health issues, whatever it may be, this a group of kids just seem to struggle. And so whatever we've done in society so far, we haven't been able to resolve that, that difference. So how do we get from here to there? How do we create a world where every child is capable of success and there are no exceptions? And Einstein gave us a clue when he says, you know, you can't solve today's significant problems at the same level of thinking you were at when you created them. In other words, he says the answers are up here. That we have this remarkable capacity to see a world differently and not buy into conventional wisdom. But sometimes we buy into conventional wisdom. See, sometimes we buy somebody else's answers without exploring our own answers. Let me give you an example of how hard it is to be thoughtful because the answers seem to be so readily available to us. Let me tell a story of a young man who was born in prison. His mother was on crack cocaine when he was born. His father was killed by a shotgun blast six months before his mother gave birth to him. If you know of a kid who was born in prison, mother was on crack cocaine when he was born, father was killed by a shotgun blast six months before he was born, do you believe that child is at risk or at hope? And before you answer, conventional wisdom will give you your answer. You don't even have to think about it. You just have to let conventional wisdom answer it for you. So if you know a kid who's been in prison, mother's on crack cocaine, father killed by a shotgun blast, 
is that kid born at risk or at hope? And the answer, the short answer is he's at risk. The thoughtful answer, he's at hope. Because that's the way he needs you to see him. Conventional wisdom gave you the wrong answer, but it was too easy. You accepted somebody else's knowledge. Let's take that boy into the foster care system because there's no one to take care of this young new baby born in prison. So foster care came in and, and said, okay, we've got to place you someplace. There's no relatives that will accept you, so we're going to put you in foster care. So now he's in foster care for the next 15 years. What we discovered about his foster care career is that he was sexually, physically, and emotionally abused for 15 years in foster care. If you know a kid who's in foster care that's emotionally, physically, and sexually abused, is that kid at risk or at hope? Conventional wisdom gives you the short answer. He's at risk. But when you stop and think about what he needs from you, you begin to understand he needs you to see him as at hope. That young man, after 15 years in foster care, the foster care people said, you know, it doesn't look like this is working out well for you, so we're taking you out of foster care, but you're 15, 16 years old, where are we going to put you? There's no place else to put him. Nobody wanted a 15, 16-year-old boy, so they put him in a reform school in those days. Did that turn off on me? They put him in a ref reform school that day. Leave this page. And for the next two years, he's in this reform school. He gets a GED. He's now 18 years old. He ages out. He ages out. If you know a kid who's now put on the streets in Cleveland, Ohio, he's been in foster care for 15 years, he's born in prison, he's now 18 years old, he's penniless, and he's homeless, is that 18-year-old at risk or at hope? The conventional wisdom gives you the short answer, but we know he's at hope. Well, let me fast forward the story and tell you who this young man is, because some of you may know him. His name is Antoine Fisher. There was a movie done of his life in 2001 starring Denzel Washington. I can tell you Antoine is now 52 years old. He's considered one of the top screenwriters in Hollywood today. He's one of the top poets in the United States and probably North America today. He's married. He has two wonderful children, a fantastic wife. He's a gardener. He's an artist. He's a community person. He's a good husband. He's a good father. If you know a person who's an artist, a community person, a good husband, a good father, has two wonderful children and a wonderful wife, and one of the top screenwriters in Hollywood and great poets and authors, is that young man at risk or at hope? So what happened? How does a kid who comes from the most horrific conditions become at hope? When all of us wrote him off from the moment he was born, we didn't even have to know him. We didn't have to know anything personally about him. We just had to know the conditions from where he came. And isn't that how we determine most of our at-risk kids? That for some reason, we stopped even knowing the kid. We just knew if he came from poverty, or he had a dis disability, or he had a mental health issue, or his parents had mental health issues, or he was in foster care, or he had ADHD, or his brothers and sisters were gang members, or no one from the family ever graduated from high school. We just had to know these conditions, and that kid was automatically at risk. And we treated him as at risk. See, my generation remembers this wonderful musical called My Fair Lady. And My Fair Lady, in, in, the, mov in, the, in the movie and the musical, was a woman named Eliza Doolittle. And she, I remember her going to Professor Higgins, and she said to Profe Professor Higgins, if you want me to act like a flower girl from the docks, treat me like a flower girl from the docks. If you want me to act like a lady, treat me like a lady. If you want me to act like a kid at risk, if you want me to act like a youth at risk, treat me like a youth at risk. As a matter of fact, talk to others about me as though I'm at risk. If you want me to act like a kid at hope, Treat me like a kid at hope. When we went around the country asking people to define a youth at risk, nobody had trouble doing that for us at all. When we asked people who were come from the youth development, child development, foster care, human services systems, education, we asked those people, those professionals, can you define for us a youth at risk? They had no difficulty doing that at all. When we asked them the next question, define a kid at hope, they didn't have no, under, no 
way of understanding what we were talking about. They had no reference point in understanding hope. See, Einstein gave us our answer way before we even had this quote on the screen. Einstein said, did you say instead of thinking kids as at risk, maybe we begin to see them at hope? Maybe we change the lens on our camera. Maybe we see things we've never seen before. Maybe instead of focusing on the risk side, we begin to focus on the hope side because I tell my friends who study psychology and psychiatry, if you study only depression, guess what you learn about? You learn about depression. You know what you don't learn about? You don't learn about joy. You don't learn about happiness. You don't learn about hope because you've never explored those areas. You've been focused on the risk side of children. So to be able to pursue this grand experiment, to be able to create a community, a, series, a group of villagers that are committed to helping every child succeed, not just some kids succeed, and not being helpful, uh, happy when just some kids succeed, when we're trying to create a village with a group of villagers like yourself and others that aren't in this room, we need something called leadership. And I have a video that describes leadership in a much different way than you've ever seen before. So let's look what leadership actually looks like. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. the status quo. We need someone to stand forward, step forward, and say it's time to change the status quo. That accepting what is isn't good enough for all the kids that we're serving. In other words, we need that shirtless leadership nut. We need someone to step forward, but not just that person. Someone who's willing to follow, and then someone else, and someone else. In other words, we need the village to come together because we're creating a world where we're moving kids from at risk to kids who become at, and we can't do that within the status quo. 
So who's the shirtless leadership nut? Who's the person willing to step forward today and say, this is how we're going to model hope in our organizations. This is how we're going to change the status quo. Now, in the US, we began to understand that in 1958, when a young lady decided to change the status quo. And she had to do something absolutely insane. And she had no authority to do it. She had no, no right to do it, according to the culture and laws that she was living in. And she had no hierarchy or bureaucracy or organization to support her. But she wanted to change something from something that wasn't right to something that was right. So what did she do? How crazy was she? How did she stand in front of a large crowd and take off her shirt and just become a nut for a moment? What did that look like? And this is what it looked like when you begin to create a movement. She sat in front of the bus. This is Rosa Parks, who launched the Civil Rights Movement in the United States. Isn't that a nutty person? And look what she did. It was so simple. That's all she said to us, follow what I do, and we can transform the world forevermore. See, that's a nut. But she couldn't do it herself, could she? If she just sat in front of the bus and no one joined her on front of the bus, that movement would have never caught fire. Nothing would have happened. See, it's that first follower and that second follower and that third follower. And why is it important to have those nuts? Why is it important to change the status quo? Because when we study kids around North America, this is what we understand about 50% of them growing up hopeful, about 50% of them not growing up hopeful. These are kids grades 5 through 12. I'll tell you, if you're not hopeful and you're in, in a grade 5 through 12, it gets tougher in life later on. Because hope is an acquired skill. If you don't learn Spanish with, a, with, a, with another language between 0 and 5, it becomes harder later on. If you don't learn to learn to read between 0 and 10, it becomes harder later on. If you don't learn to be hopeful, it becomes la harder later on. So the idea here is when do we begin to teach hope? Do we wait till kids become adults? Do we wait to be, before we get these statistics and find out that half of our kids are growing up less than hopeful? Furthermore, we're finding out that 40% of our kids are growing up disengaged in our schools. Disengaged in our schools. And if these kids are disengaged, can you imagine their own children? And these kids are growing up less than hopeful. Can you imagine their own children? See, it's not about this generation. It's about every generation that's about to come. So early on, we began to talk about, well, Rick, you're, you're trying to help them become successful and hopeful and, and engaged and all those grand things. Uh, you still haven't defined this, this idea of cultural success, because we know there's personal success, there's organizational success, but within the grand experiment, there's something larger, something that we all can be part of, not just the schools in terms of education, not just the mental health organizations, not just the foster care, not just the disability organizations that focus on their particular piece of the pie, but something that we can do together that creates a healthy environment for all. And maybe this is what we can do together. Maybe we could remind kids that we're all here to help them become contributing members of their home and families, their communities, their education careers, through their hobbies and recreation. When has hobbies and recreation ever become a critical piece of a child's development? It's kind of that ancillary piece, that leisure piece, that fun piece, but we've got more important work to do when it comes to education and career. So what do we default to? We default to one question. We talk about a child's future, we talk in terms of one question. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Let me ask you again, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's more than that for kids, isn't it? It's what kind of mom or dad do you want to be when you grow up? Husband or wife do you want to be when you grow up? Uncle or aunt do you want to be when you grow up? Who do you want to help when you grow up? Where do you want to live when you grow up? Do you want to live in the desert? Do you want to live where it snows? Do you want to live where it never snows? Do you want to live by an island? Do you want to live in a big house? Let the kids multi-dimensionally think about their future. We've restricted a child's future. We don't allow them to think beyond what do they want to be when they grow up. See, hope comes with options. It's when you run out of options, you run out of hope. It's a learned skill. It's like learning to read, write, do math and science. It's like learning to wipe your bottom. Somebody has to teach you how to do it. You have to learn to become hopeful. Somebody has to teach you how to do that. And when they restrict it to only one dimension, you have very few options in life. 
Well, I think I want to be a doctor, but I'm not sure. Does that mean I'm not going to be successful? No, you have so many different choices, so many different options. The success is achieved as a direct result of knowing you contribute to forward life de destinations. So if that's what we can do together, what's this definition of hope? What happens when we put hope underneath a microscope and look at its DNA? What happens when we put hope underneath a microscope and look at its DNA? And this is what we'd find. That hope is the ability to visit your future. Where is the child's future? Four destinations, not just one. To visit your future, home and family, education, career, community service, hobbies, and recreation. When you can visit your future in those four destinations, return to the present and prepare yourself for the journey. Isn't that a life of hopefulness? When you can see your future and know how you prepare for that future, isn't that the definition of hope? Now let me play a mind game with you. Let's take hope off of that definition and substitute education. Isn't education the ability to visit your future, return to the present, prepare yourself for the journey? Let me take education off and put the word community in there. Isn't the reason for our communities is to help kids see their future, return to the present, prepare for the journey? How about if I put mental health there? Isn't the whole ID 